Now in Romans chapter 2, we always want to make sure we understand the context of what we're reading. Always. And sometimes I'll end up making applications of Scripture that may not be the absolute direct um, intended purpose, but, the, but it has a lot of meaning that is applicable in, in other areas. And uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate that, and, and we'll see that through other scriptures as well, that there's concepts being taught. Uh, the direct context here, of course, Romans chapter 2 is coming right off the tail end of Romans chapter 1. And when this letter was written, there were no chapter divisions, so it's just going to keep reading. At the end of Romans chapter 1, we're getting the whole list of people who are reprobate. In the, you know, the middle, the end, it, it goes through all of these things about reprobates. And then continues on in chapter 2 saying, Therefore, thou art inexcusable, man, whosoever thou that judges. So the context he's referring to reprobates. And that's why, as you continue to read through Romans chapter 2, he's talking about people who are resting in the law and not in the grace of God. And he's, and he's bringing up a lot of things about eternal life and, and people being judged of God according to their works. So we get that in the context of the passage. However... So, there, so when we're reading this, I'm not going to go through every single verse. I just want to make it clear that I do understand the context of this passage and that everyone understands the context of this passage so we don't misapply certain portions of, this, of the passage that don't apply to the area I'm going to be applying it to. And the area I'm applying is, is that very first verse there in chapter 2. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, Thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. This is a truth that kind of goes even beyond the context. Okay, you can pull this verse out, and this stands alone. It doesn't matter who you are. God is not a respecter of persons. And if you're going to judge, however you judge other people, you better expect that same judgment to come unto you. This is not the only passage that states that truth. This is found in multiple places throughout Scripture. Matthew chapter 7 being a primary example of judging and not being a hypocrite when you judge and when you judge you better expect that that condemnation is going to come back down upon you now in light of all the events that happened i think there's a very pertinent subject to be preaching on with pastor donnie romero having all of his secret sins that he was partaking in while he was pastoring a church and literally preaching on things like husbands and wives and preaching on things like adultery and preaching on all these different sins that he is guilty of himself. And you know what? I don't understand how someone that's supposed to be a man of God doesn't fear God and can stand up behind a pulpit and preach these things and preach the word of God and not apply that to yourself and be shaking and trembling in your own shoes and, and, and falling down on your face in repentance and screaming out for mercy to God as you preach these things. It's beyond me. And you know what? I don't know what's coming his way. I'm, I'm a little bit scared because I know the God of the Bible. And he has judged and preached. And you know what? I know that the Bible's true. When God says that you're going to be judged the way that you judge, it's coming his way. And all I could do is say, you know, we're going to pray for Mrs. Romero and the victims of his sins. And this is a great example also of how when you sin, you never just impact yourself. It is never just you that is affected by your sins. And this is just a, a blaring example of that. You can say, oh, well, what was he doing? He was the one doing drugs, or he was just the one drinking. He was the one just, just doing this stuff. You know, he wasn't getting anyone else involved. Look what it's done to his family. Look what it's done to his church. Look what it's done to his life. Look what it's done to everyone else. He hates his wife. He hates his church, and he hates God. You say, how could you say that? No, I know. No, he does. Because you know why? Because his actions say otherwise. Just like the Bible says that if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you if you spare the rod, that you hate your child, 
You know what? I believe the Bible when it says that. No, no, no. I really love my son. Yeah, well, you know, if you're not disciplining him properly, the Bible says you hate him, and I believe God's word. And if you, if you lied, if you could look your spouse in the face and lie to them while going behind their back and committing adultery, that's not love. Amen. That's hatred. When you could stand behind a pulpit and, and try to tell people that you're supposed to be leading to live a certain way and you're going around and doing the exact things you're preaching against, you don't love those people. You're hurting people. You're, you're, people are putting trust in you. And when you, when you turn out to be some stinking hypocrite, no one is going to believe you ever again. And then you're going to shake the confidence of the people who were trusting you. So many people we run into have the testimony, well, I was in church and I was, you know, everything was going great. And I thought I was learning a lot. And then it turns out that, that this, this preacher, this pastor was hurting people or defiling people or involved in all this sin. And you know what? I've had it with that. You know, I don't want to have anything to do with that because they talk all holy and they talk all this game and, they, and they're just a bunch of stinking hypocrites and I don't want to have anything to do with that. And you know what? I don't blame people for having the attitude of not wanting to have anything to do with hypocrites. I don't want to have anything to do with hypocrites either. And this is something to take to heart, everybody. Because when you get involved in sin, you're naturally going to want to cover it up. But you know what the biggest problem is? Is when you continue in that sin and then continue to judge. See, when I after I got saved, I knew getting drunk was a sin. Now, there's a lot of things I didn't really know. I mean, in the Bible... I didn't like get in church and, and, and really start learning and growing. But there's some things that I knew just weren't right. I knew committing fornication wasn't right. I knew getting drunk was a sin. That, those are pretty obvious things. You almost don't even need to read the Bible at all to understand those things. But when I was guilty of those things, you know what I didn't do? I didn't go around telling other people not to do those things. I mean, even just the conviction of being a hypocrite. And then the audacity to overcome that built-in mechanism of God that ought to humble you and just go beyond and continue doing things is beyond me. And the Bible gives very serious warnings about this. And the Bible says, you know what? Thou art inexcusable. There is no excuse and I'll tell you this right now, because I've, I've seen a lot of different things and thoughts and opinions. Now is not the time for restoration. Now is not the time to be going, oh, well, what, you know, I, I've taught on this. I've preached on this before. We've read through 1 Corinthians 5. I believe we'll be going there uh, later on in the sermon. But the point is, you know, 1 Corinthians 5 outlines who we're not even supposed to eat with. Okay, and adulterers, guess what? That applies. It says fornicators, and you better believe that adultery is even a worse form of fornication. And it says to, to you know, remove that wicked person from among you and not have anything to do with that person. The person who gets caught committing sin and doing wrong almost always will say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it because they got caught. Amen. But that doesn't mean that they're truly repentant in their heart. Right. Now, when it comes to Donnie Romero, I actually spoke with him on the phone on Friday. I, don't, I didn't hear repentance. He said he was. But you know what? You can see through a lot of statements and, and the the, how genuine people are by, by some of the words that they use. When you start trying to throw all these examples, oh, but what about David in the Bible? What, you know, don't go telling me why I need to just all of a sudden just start like, like you're deserving of some type of, of forgiveness from me when you just get caught doing some stuff and wouldn't have, you know, 
I fell into this trap too when I first started hearing some of the information. I thought, wow, hey, at least he, had, he, he was noble enough to step down when there's a problem that's disqualifying him. And probably everyone had the same approach. Why? Because he was, uh, out of almost everybody, he was a, his, him, his family, are very close friends of mine. I've known him, I think, pretty well, very well. I've been there for him. He's been there for me. So this strikes a very personal chord for me. But you know what? I love God and Jesus more than I love man. And I will not, I will not take the friendship of a, of a, of a wicked person over, over my Lord any day of the week. I believe he's saved. But God has judgment for a reason. And judgment needs to come. And I'm going to leave that. That's left up to God to judge. His own words are going to come back and haunt him. Guarantee you that if, if it doesn't, then the Bible's not true. Because God will judge him. And I believe God already has. We've been praying for his family. You already know some of the bad news that happened. That's the judgment of God. And unfortunately, people end up being recipients that are innocent from someone else's sin. And I've covered this in sermons. You can just look at the sin of Achan. You can look at other sins that people who had their secret sins. They thought they weren't impacting anyone else. The sin of Achan, what happened? People died as a result. Innocent people lost their lives. They had no idea he did what he did. He brought that on other people. Look what happened when David sinned. How many people died? How about when people were committing fornication? How many people died in the Bible by, by sinning and uh, thousands of people, other people died that didn't commit those sins as a result of the actions of one person? There's always repercussions. Verse number two, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them that which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? He's not going to escape the judgment of God. There's no way. And look at verse number four. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Despise it. Think about God's goodness, his forbearance, his long suffering, what he puts up with with us. When you get involved in willful sinning, you know something's wrong, you do it anyways, and then you're preaching against it, and you're living this duplicitous life, saying to other people, you despise, you're, you're taking advantage of and trampling underfoot the Son of God. God's mercy, His grace, His forgiveness, His long-suffering, His forbearance. Now you're doing despite to all of that by, by, by trampling over and taking advantage of it and just thinking that somehow you're going to get away with things or whatever. It's the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance. You know, the reason why God hadn't come down and judge right away was to grant, you know, but was to grant repentance. But you know, when repentance isn't there, there's no more mercy and in, in forbearance. That's why verse number five says, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart. Impenitent means you're not repentant. Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And then verse number 11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what position you have, it doesn't matter how much good you've done in the past. When it comes to this type of a judgment, there's. <laughs> God's law is there for a reason. And, and it blows my mind how anyone can, 
even get to that point. And this is probably a sermon for another time, but I'll tell you what, it, it, this didn't just happen overnight. You don't get into prostitution, drugs, and gambling just, oh, well, I was kind of bored one night, so I just decided to go out and gamble and then got drunk and then, and it, you know. No, I'm sorry, that's not where it started. It started even before. So whenever these actions started, the heart turned way before that. The heart against his wife, his heart against God happened way before that. Because you don't actually start committing these things, especially when you know them. Especially when you know what's, you know, these things to be just wicked and wrong. You, you don't just, oops, I, I, the brief conversation I had with them, I said, how did you even order the first drink? How did you even bring yourself to do that? I can't fathom that. I don't even understand that. How could you do that? It's because his heart turned way before even stepping foot into a place to, to, to even do the things that he did. It's a shame. It's shameful. And you know what? I'm glad that people are willing to at least call it out. And that not for the sake of friendship, try to sweep it under the rug. Because if there's going to be any credibility at all moving forward, these things need to just be exposed for what they are and say, you know what? I didn't know. I mean, he deceived everybody. He deceived me. I didn't know he was lying. I didn't know he had these secret sins. It's not anyone else's fault. It's not God's fault. It's not the Bible's fault that one person chooses to do some really wicked things. Unfortunately, it causes a lot of damage now. But that's all the more reason why we just need to say, hey, this is wicked and we're calling it out. And it doesn't matter if he's my buddy or not. That's wicked and that needs to be rebuked and that needs to be put away from among us. And you know what? Judgment needs to happen from God and true repentance needs to happen. Now, when true repentance happens and, and he's been delivered unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, then great, we'll, we'll welcome him back when he's, when he's truly repentant. But until then, I don't trust the repentance of someone who just got caught and wasn't coming clean with anything until evidence was shown forth and sin upon sin was just covered up and covered up and covered up. That is not integrity. Only admitting, so who knows? And I don't even know what else there might be. Right. I asked him on the moon, is there anything else? Is that everything? He said, oh, yeah, that's everything. Well, okay, that's what you say. But that's, that's what you were saying before other stuff came out, too. So it's meaningless. Jump down to verse number 18. It says, And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Verse 24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. And now that's what's happening. When it's referring to the Gentiles, it's referring to unsaved people here in the context. It's referring to just people who don't believe in God. You say, you know what? The name of God now is being blasphemed because of you. Because you're a teacher that teaches these things not to do them, and you do them anyways. And you're taking the, the perfect law of the Lord, you're taking the Bible, you're taking God's word and saying, thus saith the Lord, don't do these things, and here, here you go going out and doing the same exact things. And that blasphemes God. The bla God gets blasphemed among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers, 
because of your actions. The news articles are already coming out. I mean, people are having a heyday with this. He's already made the headlines on the, you know, preaching. And, and look, the doctrine that he taught was right for the most part. I mean, what I've heard, there's a couple of things I disagree with him on, but the Bible, was, the Bible is always right, regardless of who's repeating the Bible or saying what the Bible says. It's not the man that makes the Bible true. It's God that makes the Bible true. So it doesn't mean that, that everything he was saying now all of a sudden was false. It just makes him the hypocrite for not, <laughs> not subjecting himself to what, he was, to what he was teaching and preaching. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, another warning. We're going to see a very explicit warning of sinning willfully knowing the truth of God. And, and look, obviously it's the events that, that's kind of causing me to preach on this subject, but I want everyone to just take heed to themselves lest you fall. Because I mentioned before, I believe that Donnie Romero is a saved man. I do. I believe that. Unless, unless there's something else that comes out that would, that would indicate otherwise. I think he is a saved man that fell. And that, and, and that did some really horrible, horrible things. And I'm not making an excuse for it. And, but we do have examples of men in the Bible that were saved that have done really horrible things. That didn't make them a reprobate. I mean, you can look at the example of King David who committed adultery and had someone killed. Those are pretty horrible things. I mean, it, it, how much worse do you get, you know? But it didn't make him unsaved. Now, when David was confronted, he handled it properly. And, and we know that from the Bible. He was repentant, and, and, but he was also judged. Look at his life. Look at what happened with his children, and his family, and, and his kingdom, and everything. I mean, he was definitely judged. He did not escape judgment. Now, he wasn't put to death. He escaped a, a human government judgment that should have been enacted. But he still didn't escape a, a judgment of God on this earth. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse number 26. So just keep this in mind. And everyone, you know, him that think at these stand and take heed lest you fall. We need to be on guard for ourselves against all manner of sin. And especially sins that you have done in the past that are going to be more likely to tempt you. I know from his own admission that the, the drinking, drugs, and gambling was all things that he'd already done in the past. I don't know about the other, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of his past too. I mean, that's not something that you would probably ever admit to normally. But given the circumstances, it probably is something he's done. So we, you know, everyone needs to take heed, whatever your past may be, you know, especially with those things that you've already done, be aware of that. I mean, I have to be very vigilant with the, with the drinking because that's something I was heavily involved with for a long time that, that I need to make sure, maybe even more than others, that I'm not anywhere close to ever having an opportunity to be in around that because I don't want to have any type of, you know, false recollection of it being fun or something. And you all have your own sins, whatever they may be, that you need to watch out for. But look at Hebrews 10, verse 26. The Bible says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, under two or three witnesses. In God's law in the Old Testament, there was no mercy shown at the execution of whatever the crime was, whatever the punishment was. Meeting out that punishment, there was no mercy shown. At least there wasn't supposed to be. You commit adultery, you're getting put to death. That's under God's law. 
And he's explaining here, hey, if you despise Moses' law, you despise God's law, you're going to die without mercy under two or three witnesses. Verse 29, of how much sorer punishment. So it's how much worse. These guys lost their lives. They say, well, how much worse is it? Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. You've been graciously saved from your sins and forgiven of your sins and you're going to turn around and then just go ahead and sin willfully, adding sin upon sin and just throwing more sin on Jesus Christ and just tre treading the Son of God underfoot. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. In this context, it's not quite the same as Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 is talking about a lot of judgment of people who were reprobate and unsaved and people who rested in the law thinking the law was going to save them. Hebrews 10 is very clearly talking about believers. It's all about his people, God's people. Of how much sore punishment do you think you're going to be worthy of when you tread underfoot the Son of God, wherewith you were sanctified? Yeah, you know what? If he's saved, he was sanctified by the blood of Christ. He is going to go to heaven when he dies. Because it doesn't matter what your sins are on this earth. They don't keep you out of heaven. If you've, once you've already been saved, you're saved forever. You don't lose your salvation. But don't forget that vengeance belongs unto God. And the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He ought to be shaking in his boots right now because that is a fearful thing. If you actually believe God's real, if you actually believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross, <laughs> you better believe that you better be pretty scared now about being in the hands of the living God and facing that type of judgment. And you know what? That's the type of thing that we need to remember before even getting to that point of getting in willful sin. We need a healthy dose of just reminder of Hebrews chapter 10 going, I, I, I don't want to experience that. The Almighty putting me through the fire because of my sin and bringing judgment upon me. His life, I mean, his life has just changed forever. There is, no, there is no undoing what was done. It's impossible. His life is already broken and shattered. Keep him in mind as an example. And think about, the Bible says, you know, be sure your sin will find you out. The things that are secret, they're going to be revealed. You don't worry about it. You're, you don't get away with things forever. You may get away with them for a short time. You may get away with them for a year or two years or three years or even five years. You may get away with, uh, you, may think you're, you may think you're getting away with things. It may not come to light immediately. You know what? If you're a child of God, I guarantee you it's going to come to light. There's wicked people out there. There's reprobates where all of their sins don't come to light while they're alive on this earth. But they will come to light at the judgment day. And they will be made known and they're going to pay for that. But God's people, I think that stuff's going to, I think that stuff comes to light even before that. Because you're going to face that punishment here on this earth. Because there is not going to be the punishment in the afterlife. You don't, you don't receive a punishment once you die and go off to be with the Lord. There's no punishment anymore. That's why you receive it in this life. And some people, some believers, God determined that I'm just going to end your life now. Don't forget that. It's a fearful thing. Turn, if you would, to... Um, 
1 Corinthians chapter 5, as I said, we we're going to look at that real quick. I mentioned it earlier. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. God will judge the whoremonger and adulterer. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 4. The Bible reads, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now in the context here, it's talking about a man who has committed sin. He's committing fornication where it says it's not so much his name among the Gentiles that he would have his, his father's wife. Now, I would assume it's not 100% it's not clear from the passage whether his father was still married to her, he's divorced, and he, and he married. That, that's the understanding that I take, is that like it's, it's one of his father's ex-wives that he ended up marrying. Because that's, and that's in the law, you're not supposed to do that. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's things against that. That's the way I take it, because that's wicked enough anyways, and that's wicked enough to deserve everything that, that he's proclaiming here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But it says here, you know what? That guy needs to just be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's what needs to happen to him. And then in, um, let me get there myself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, The Bible says in verse number six, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must you need to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Donnie Romero is a fornicator, is covetous, because he was desiring things that he couldn't have outside of his marriage, being an adulterer. A drunkard getting high on dope, drinking booze by his own admission. And maybe even more, I mean, multiple things on this one list. This li any one of these things is bad enough. Any one of these things is bad enough to deserve the judgment brought forth here. And it's just like, Yep, check, check, check. For what have I to do to judge them also there without? Do not ye judge them there within. You know what? I'm going to judge. Them there without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That's why, you know what he said in his video? Is he still going to stay there and be a member? No, he's not. They're not going back to that church. Why? Because they put away from among themselves that wicked person. That's why. And I'm not going to have anything to do with them either. Because I have respect for God's word. It's sad. It's not so much sad for him. He made his own decisions. I'm not sad or sorry for him yeah. at all. Yeah. It's sad for the movement. It's sad for the cause of Christ. It's sad for the people of that church. It's sad for his family. It's sad for everyone affected by what he did. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. I'm going to close with 1 John chapter 5. These aren't things that you can just blow over. 
Don't get the bleeding heart mentality when it comes to extremely grievous, wicked sin. When you start having the soft spot for the people that do such things, you don't hate the sin as much as you ought to. And you don't love the victims as much as you ought to. When you start getting this bleeding heart, soft spot attitude saying, well, we should just welcome him back. He said he's sorry. What do you mean? Let's bring it. No. No. Let him bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. You know, I tried to give him a little instruction. I said, you know what? If you're going to even show anyone at all that you're sorry at all, because his little lame attempt at trying to say he was sorry in the two-sentence prepared statement where he didn't even mention any of his sins at all, just, oh, I didn't rule. Right. Yeah, that's an understatement. I didn't rule my house well. Yeah. <laughs> you think that's the reason why you're disqualified? No kidding you didn't rule your house well. You didn't love your wife. You didn't love your kid. You didn't love anybody. I said, why don't you make a video saying, this is what I did and own up to it. And just put it out there and say, if you're going to be a man about it, just say, hey, I did this stuff. And let the world know. And just tell them this is what I did. Lay it out there and whatever, whatever the consequences are is what they are. That's the right thing to do. But has he done that yet? Nope. You expect me to believe he's repentant and sorry? Sorry, I don't think so. Because you know what he has the opportunity to do now? He's, oh, well, other people are saying that about me. That, that's not true or whatever. Why don't you just put it out there? I mean, it's already out there. We'll be worried about your kids finding out. Well, you know what? You should have thought about that before you did it. You're worried about people finding out. You're worried about other people in your family finding out. You should have thought about that before doing it. We don't cover it up. First John chapter 5, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Wow, what a great passage talking about our petitions, our prayers to God and saying, hey, if we go to God, he hears us. We're his children. I love that about God, that he's going to hear our prayers and we could go to him and ask him for stuff and he's going to hear us and listen to us. But let's keep reading here because he's going to explain even further. Verse number 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. So he's saying, you see your brother getting involved in some sin that's not unto death. He's saying, this is how much God listens to our prayers. You can pray to God for that person and intercede for that person and God will hear you. And God can extend mercy and long suffering. But then he says, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin. Let's make no doubt about that, right? All unrighteousness is sin and we're all sinners and there is a sin not unto death. All sin is not equal, my friends. All sin is not sin. And it's all just the same thing. No, there are grievous sins. There are capital sins. There are sins unto death. And when it says a sin unto death, it's, it's not just talking about one particular sin. Just as it says, um, there is a sin not unto death. There's not just one sin that's not unto death. It's talking about two categories of sins. There are sins that carry a death sentence on them because they're so wicked. And there are sins that don't carry a death sentence on them because they're not as wicked. Read through Leviticus 18 through 20 and you'll start to see the sins that are worthy of death according to God's word. And you know what one of those sins is? Adultery. 
So you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to pray to God to have mercy on Donnie Romero, who's guilty of committing a sin unto death. I'm not going to do it. Because he deserves whatever judgment comes his way. And the, guys, the Bible's explaining to us, don't you pray for that person like that. Amen. Don't go to him with that. God doesn't want to hear that. It just needs to be judged and dealt with. That's why God said to Joshua with Achan, when, when Joshua's on his face and he's just like, God, you know, what do we do? And I thought you were with us. I thought, you know, and God's like, get up. Deal with the guy that sinned. And we went through this along, you know, way back when we started the book of Joshua at the, with, the, with the Jericho. Right after, right after the victory of Jericho, Achan stole some stuff and, and, and took the wicked thing that he wasn't supposed to take and, and, and hid it. And he had his secret sin. And God was no longer with them because of that. And it caused people to die. And then Joshua was just like, God, what, you know, I thought you were going to be with us. And you know, what do we do? And what's going on? Praying to God, asking for mercy. And you know, God's like, get up. That's the time to pray for me. Go, go deal with that. Go deal with the guy that needs to be judged. And what was the judgment? He needed to be put to death because he committed a sin unto death. So no, I'm not going to take the bleeding heart approach. It's not biblical. It's not right. Under Moses' law, people died without mercy when they commit a sin unto death. And now, okay, we, are not, we do not have a government under God's law. So no, we're not going to take the law in our own hands and never teach that and never believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. But I'm not going to go and pray for the guy that's, that's committed sin unto death. God's going to judge him. He's in the hands of the living God now. And we need to keep just, just a warning for ourselves and your own sins and your own life. When you start doing things willfully, you know what? You ought to have a fear of God. He didn't have the proper fear. He didn't have enough fear of God to not even walk into the place or whatever, whatever the first thing was that was getting down that path. He didn't have a proper fear of God. That's why I boggled my mind. I'm thinking, like, how could, you even, how could you even order the drink? How could the words even come out of your mouth, let alone put the glass to your lips? How could you even, how could you even do that? I mean, that's because he doesn't fear God. You ought to have established in your own mind God's word and God's law and that proper fear to say, you know what, I don't even want to know what God would do to me if I did this sin. I don't even want to find out. You can see the way that he dealt with a lot of different sins in the Bible. It's not pretty. It's not good. None of us is perfect, but you know what? Not everyone's an adulterer and a drunkard and a fornicator and an extortioner and idolater. That's for sure. We need to keep some level of standards and like I said before, if, you know, if you're having a, a bleeding heart mentality over some of the worst sins, you don't hate the sin properly, you don't love God's word enough, and you don't love the victims enough. My first emotions was grief and sorrow and sadness just over the fact that he was resigning before knowing everything. As soon as more information came to light on what was actually done, that turned into anger. And I think righteous indignation that someone would do that and, and commit such wicked sins and stand behind a pulpit and claim to be a man of God. And, and every single time, <laughs> every single time he preached now, it's just, 
any, any amount of good or work that he's done now is just kind of thrown out the window. Undone by his own, his own actions. Take heed lest you fall. And don't forget, as the Bible said in Romans 2, you know, thou art inexcusable, man, whosoever thou art that judges. If you're doing the same exact thing, you don't have an excuse. And with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. We ought to judge righteously. That's what Jesus said to do. Judge righteous judgment. Apostle Paul said, I don't even have to be there. I've already judged what needs to be done with that wicked man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So I don't even have to be there for it. I'll tell you what, what needs to be done. He needs to be judged. And he has a judgment. We ought to be all for judging righteously. But always, always, always remember that that same judgment will come upon you to help keep yourself humble and keep yourself straight and keep yourself walking the path that you need to be walking. Because the more you see how God deals with this stuff, the more you should not want to have anything to do with it. And especially if you're going to preach on it. I mean, it just tells me you don't really believe it. If you can preach on it and then just, just do it. I don't want to end on a, on a, on a sour note. As bad as what he did is how much damage it's caused, it's not the end of anything. It's the end of him. It's not the end of Steadfast Baptist Church. It's not the end of, of anybody doing right. Those are his actions. He's going to have to answer God for that. Maybe it makes our job a little bit harder. So be it. But we're going to keep on doing what we need to do. And we need to just keep pushing ahead and you know what, especially as our church, we're Stronghold Baptist Church. We're doing what we're doing. We're going to do the job we have that, that God set out for us to do here. And we're not going to let that slow us down or discourage us. In fact, I don't know about you, but I mean, to me, it just fires me up even more. And I see or hear about things like that. I'm just like, you know what, I need to make sure I got myself even more in line just in general and to kind of just, just tighten myself up and say, okay, well, I definitely don't want to be the cause of a bunch of damage. So I'm just going to reevaluate things on my own and just be like, okay, well, <laughs> well, what else can I look at? If, if people are to look at me, you know, is there, is there going to be some big thing that's going to, you know, if, if this becomes exposed, like it's going to, you know, I've said before, look, I'm a sinner. I know I'm not, per you guys just know I'm not perfect. Okay. I'm not claiming to be without sin, but I'll tell you what, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not a drunkard. Okay, all the things in 1 Corinthians 5, you better believe that that's not, it may have at one point applied to my life. But I, I tell you right now, the clear conscience before, before man and God, that that is, not, that is not where I'm at. But it's good to be reminded of God's judgment and that we can maintain a healthy fear of the Lord in our own lives. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your long suffering and for your forbearance. And God, I pray that you would please just help us not to despise the, your long suffering and forbearance, dear Lord, and um, that we would treat your words with utmost respect and honor. and especially what, what Jesus Christ did for us. That we wouldn't uh, allow our flesh to, to get the victory over us. Lord, help us to, to stay humble and, and help us to walk in the Spirit, dear Lord, and, and help us not to be discouraged by the actions of others, but that we can just continue to, to serve you and, and to make this year uh, the best year that, that we've seen and continue to just increase and do more and more for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.